Well, welcome. We're so happy to have everybody in the room today. And um, I'm going to start by saying I'm Diane Quinn. I am the director of the Port Townsend Marine Science Center and chair mover. Um, <laughs> um, I'd like to acknowledge that we live and work on the traditional land of many Coast Salish people, particularly the Sklalem people, the strong people. We respect and are grateful for this land, these waters, and the people who have inhabited them since time immemorial and who continue to steward this place for future generations. We, um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. The Future of Oceans lecture series is now in its 10th year, and this is a huge accomplishment. So, yeah. I want to thank, first I want to thank um, Peter Rines, who's in the back of the room, because he was one of the people who actually helped many times to think through who would be great to have in this series, and who does he know at University of Washington, and who does he know in the whole field of practice that we would want to hear from, and so thank you for all of your years of helping with that. Um, and we still love hearing your ideas. And then I want to thank the Darrow family for their um, unfailing, yes, <laughs> support of this series, people who actually believe that lifelong learning means lifelong. So um, we are really grateful to you, and I thank them every time I see them, but it's never enough, so thank you very much. Um, so why fossils? I guess the thing I want to start before I introduce our two speakers is that um, the Port Townsend Marine Science Center for a while had a natural history exhibit. It has a very modest collection of fossils that have come from different places. And in the spring, we started thinking about what could we do to sort of make sense of that collection, uh, get some localities, IDs, and um, other information on that collection. And we thought we would use our flagship landing gallery space as a workshop, which we've done a couple of other times. Some of you have been there when we've had the elephant seal out and worked on that, or the gray whale worked on that. So we moved all the fossils to that gallery, where for the next three months we'll be working on that collection and trying to make more sense of what we have and um, taking photographs and doing some cataloging work. But that was just too simple, so we thought, well, let's just make an exhibit, too. So um, there's an, an exhibit called Fossil Lab, and uh, one of the things that I love about it is that we have our volunteers who will be down there talking about fossils in our collection, but also the Quimper Geological Society has people from their group that will be down there with their collections, and some of our members and volunteers will bring their collections in to share with the public. and. I think this is gonna be a really fun few months of really like the whole fossil community getting to see who, who has what. Um, so the thing that we love about each and every fossil is that each and every fossil represents a life on Earth at some time in history. And fossils tell us so many things, but the real field of paleontology has changed so much in the past hundred, 50 years and the questions that are being asked now and the way fossils are being used by people like Dr. Nesbitt are to help answer questions and look at situations in the past around climate events or help us understand, <laughs> they did that on purpose because they knew I was going to say evolution. Um, <laughs> Um, or to help us think about extinction processes and what's going, what's going on right now by looking at our fossil past. So um, that just made me think, well, if we're going to get our fossil collection cataloged and we're going to have an exhibit, how much more scheming can I do to get Liz and David here because their book is coming out serendipitously right about now. And um, so... They seemed like the perfect people to have for our fossil weekend. Um, the thing about both of these people is that they are 
great researchers, they both love to ask questions and then dig in and figure out, trace every trail to get the answer to those questions. And then they're both really great communicators for people like me who are just mere mortals who did not study paleontology or biology and help make that information really accessible and understandable. Liz Nesbitt is curator emerita from the Burke Museum of Natural History at University of Washington, but that's not really all. So as curator, she was um, in charge of the whole invertebrate fossil collection, but also as curator, she helped develop and curate exhibits like Cruising the Fossil Freeway, the version of it that was in Seattle with, um, based on Kirk Johnson and Rachel's book, and Earthquakes, the big one, the traveling version of which was at Port Townsend Marine Science Center in about 2008, and several, oh, evolution evidence. And while she was curating exhibits and curating the invertebrate fossil collection, she was also teaching UW classes because she was faculty at UW. And um, on top of that, she also has a family. So, um, and all of those things are all based on the fact that she's a researcher who does field work and goes out in the field and does her own research and publishes her research. So this is like, sort of like that, I think Ginger Rogers said, I have to do all the same things that Fred Astaire does, only backward and wearing feathers. And it's a little bit like that. Um, <laughs> So, so Liz worked on so many education programs, really figuring out ways to get the Burke collections into students' hands and help us really think through what are the questions that we want to ask. Why is this the question to ask? Why do we want to know this? How do we know this? Why is this important? Why does it matter? And that contextualization of information is really necessary when you're trying to teach huge you know, numbers of students every year at all different grade levels. So um, I'm deeply in awe of her. David B. Williams has a stack of books this high that he has written in his lifetime um, on a number of subjects, um, but the award-winning Too High and Too Steep, Home Waters, which is one of my favorite books about why we love the Salish Sea. And um, he worked on a lot of curriculum at the Burke as well, but um, he also has um, a weekly uh, street smart naturalist what is it? It's a newsletter, really, it's, um, that you can subscribe to. And he takes people on walking tours. And he's just um, another one of the people that you, if you have a question, you can you know, ask David. And you know he will keep asking who he needs to ask until he gets an answer to that question, and then make it completely understandable for everybody else. So the fact that these two people teamed up with all of their curiosity and all of their communication skills to make this book is just fantastic for us. So that's enough for me, because they'll start to get embarrassed. Um, but I really uh, like to just tell them how much I appreciate everything I've learned from both of them in the 20 something years I've known them. And I know you will enjoy hearing from them today. So please welcome Dr. Liz Nesbitt and David B. Williams. Thank you, Diane. Uh, it is an honor and pleasure and just amazing to see so many people here. Uh, thank you for coming out on this, uh, what I think is sort of a sunny winter day uh, <laughs> in the Northwest. We all know about that. Um, and of course, I'd like to thank Diane for asking us to speak up here and Austin for making it easy from an electronic and technological point of view. And he said if we say anything stupid, he's gonna edit it out. So we're free to say whatever we want. So that's sort of scary. So yes. <laughs> so what we'd like to do is I just wanna talk a little bit at the beginning about what the book is about. And then Liz and I are gonna be in conversation for a bit about the book and some aspects of it a little bit sort of behind the scenes. And then we're gonna focus on three of the stories in the book. And those are really the, the heart of the book. So the book 
has sort of two sections. There's an introductory section at the beginning that talks about geology, geology of Washington State, a little bit about plate tectonics, a little bit about how fossils form, uh, and really tries to bring you up to speed. Our goal was not to write a textbook at all. Our goal, as Diane uh, said, is to communicate and write in a way that, that is, we hope, compelling and ultimately hopes our hope is that you'll go out in the field and want to explore the landscape around you. That really is a central part of the book. So this, there's an introductory section, again, that just sort of gives you the background. But then the heart and soul of the book are 24 profiles of a different, either a plant, an animal, or an ecosystem. And Liz will talk a little bit more about the sort of how she came to choose those. But that's really what the book is about. The, each of them we see as sort of a short story about the, the geology, about the paleontology, about the people. How did this, what was the life of this animal or plant or this ecosystem in the past? And how could we help you understand it? And also we hope help you relate to the story as well as to the people who were ferreting out the story, whether it's finding the fossil or doing the science. Because this book is about people, not just about fossils. And that was really a central goal for us. Before I launch into in, uh, interviewing or chatting or carrying our conversation on, what I really want to be, say, and I've said this before and I will say this every talk that we give together, is this book is Liz's brainchild and she'll talk more about it. She is the inspiration behind it. She is the person who came up with the profiles. Um, we worked together, but it was... Uh, for me, a unique experience. Usually when I write books, I am the person, as Diane says, who does all the research. And so it was great. I didn't have to really think much. Liz did everything, and I just sort of helped along with some of the editing here and there. But it really is her book. And the other part of it is we've been working on this book for four years. We started in, in 20, 1990, 2019. I can't add. In 2019. And... I'm sure you all have been in projects or marriages or whatever, and they don't always go the way you expect them to. But I can honestly say that we have become better friends, and we've become friends because of this. We knew each other as colleagues, and that to me is one of the highlights of this book, was to be able to spend more time with Liz and see how she works, how she thinks, and to be able to help bring that those stories to life. So that's just really my, I wanna start with that. And my first question for Liz, is what was the inspiration? I mean, this is a long time coming. Wow, thank you, David, for all of that. Um, this book was a long time coming. I've been thinking of this book for a very long time. As I have spent many, many years teaching undergraduate students, being in the book and talking to adults, talking to children, traveling around Washington doing field trips, I realized what we have in Washington and nobody ever knew what we have in terms of fossils. Everybody thinks Washington's just a bunch of volcanoes. There's a lot of volcanoes, but there's also a lot of fossils. And I wanted this to be encapsulated into something that was interesting for everybody. I didn't want a textbook, I didn't want a guidebook. I wanted a book that was of interest. So I realized that I needed to write it. There was nobody else who could do it. I needed to write it. And once I had written out the plan of what I wanted to do, I realized that actually I'm a scientist, and it was written like a scientist for scientists, so that was awful. Nobody was going to read that. And I needed somebody who would bring life to the book, who would bring levity to the book, who would bring this idea that you can go anywhere and find things interesting. And David was the obvious choice for that. I love his books. I've loved all his books. Um, and so I asked him, and he said, yes, he would love to be on the project. So now I have the opportunity to, to ask him, which I haven't in all the four years we worked together, why did he want to do this? Why did you want to do this, David? I, I mean, those people who've uh, heard me last night, we did talk a little bit about this yesterday. I mean, as you well know, writing for an academic press is truly lucrative. Um, so I saw money, I saw Liz, getting together with Liz, I saw cash, cash, cash. So. Um, now that I've deposited all that money, I can uh, tell you the other reason why. And it gets back to that relationship that we had at the museum in terms of knowing that Liz was a scientist, but not a scientist who saw the world in terms of communication as a scientist, but someone who wanted to share those ideas. 
And as a writer, what I try to do is I'm always trying to, I hope, encourage people to get outside, to make connections to place, to that landscape that is around all of us, and to pay attention, to slow down, and think about what is out there, and not be focused on getting from A to B, and, and being careful. And really, this idea of paying attention, and fossils were just, what, for me, it was just another way to pay attention, another way to connect to place, to think about, okay, when I'm out there or somewhere, and you know, I'm out on the coast, and you come across a fossil of say, part of a whale. Not that I've ever done that, but I could imagine it having been with Liz. But to think, wow, there were these unusual animals here over time. Washington has these amazing stories. And it just makes me happier to be out in the field having that knowledge, having that story to share, to know, to again, I keep coming back to this, it's all about connections for me. And that's what this, I hope this book would be able to do. And I, and I think we've been, lucky to be able to do it together, so. Yeah, we have, we have. Yeah. So one of the things that David wanted to put in the book, and I'm gonna ask him about this now, was what happens if you find a fossil? Because one of the things we wanted to do in the book was let people understand that you can find fossils, but there are rules. So David wrote a lot about that, so I'm gonna ask him to do it, remember? I did. I do. do you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> what happens if you find a fossil? Well, if you find it on private land, it is your fossil. You, if, if, if it's your private land. That's a key point about private land. Um, and we won't go down that avenue. But on public land, it's, it's definitely a different issue, that it is not your fossil. Um, you need to, con it, the, what we always recommend is if you find something, don't dig it up. You know, what you find, if you can figure out, the, maybe take a photo, get, figure out where it is, I mean, nowadays we all have GPS, and then you reach out to either, the, if it's a public land agency, reach out to someone there, reach out to someone at the Burke Museum, our, the paleontologists there are equipped to be able to help you down the direction that you need to go. Um, but it, it's, it's not, on public land, it's not your fossil. And the Burke is always willing to look and if you have a fossil that you collected someplace, the people there are willing to look, and they will not, they, they cannot and will not take it from you. Their goal is to understand it. What can we learn from that fossil? Was but that? if it's a very interesting scientific fossil, they will try hard to talk you out of it. <laughs> Do you have much luck with that? No. <laughs> I mean, most people, somebody brought in a fossil, a beautiful fossil today, a Laracasis apter. Um, shell, and, and that's a special fossil, and you don't want to take that from somebody. You want people to enjoy it. But for scientific reasons, and I'm going to be talking about whales, um, those fossils are so valuable because there are so few fossil whales, and Washington is the one place we have spectacular fossil whales. So I'm going to talk about that. Yeah. And, and, one of, and several of the stories in the book address people who found fossils. I mean, there's this sort of legendary story of the people out of the Blue Lake Rhino, if you're familiar with this, this basalt cave that formed around a dead, bloated rhinoceros, which is completely unusual, amazing, but they reported it back, some of the bones they found. There was a school teacher out on the peninsula who found a variety of fossils, including one from an, an animal that there's, I think, only been like four or five, that Colponomus, this animal that's, we're not, two, two, that's less than four or five. <laughs> I did the math for much of the book. And, uh, but she found this, and this animal that we don't really understand, but she, she did that. She also found a dolphin, an early dolphin. So people do it, and that's what's amazing is what we have gained, and one of the things that we, we name people because we think it's important to recognize and acknowledge those who found the fossils and made that contribution for us. Um, so a question that I'm always sort of interested in is thinking about, and this is sort of about the book, and one thing that we really feel lucky about with the book are the, is the, are the imagery. Could you, you oh, were so yeah. involved with yes. that. And I see some of you have the book so you can look. The fossil pictures, almost all the fossil pictures, the photographer was Mike Rich. Um, and I knew when I started thinking about this book that I needed to have lots of fossil pictures. This is before I told the University of Washington Press this was going to be an expensive book. Um, <laughs> And Mike came in, he is a retired Boeing engineer, and he contacted the Burke and said he wanted to volunteer, and we have a volunteer coordinator. 
um, and he said he would like to do photography. At the time, I had had a grant and got a really fancy, lovely camera set up, which I knew I was not technically available to do. I needed somebody to do it for me. So when I saw that Mike wanted to do pho photographs, I said, come and come and do it, and he did, and he is amazing. And he spent many endless hours with these photographs trying to get it right. We tried black backgrounds, we tried navy blue backgrounds, we tried white backgrounds, we tried different lighting systems, we tried different uh, post photography, messing around. He was the most patient person and he's a volunteer. So that was really exciting part of the book. The illustrations, the pretty pictures that you see of reconstructions, those are part of the exhibit at the book. So I don't know how many of you know we have a new building. We have an absolutely spectacularly beautiful new building. And to do that, we all had to do new exhibits. So all of us curators would get together and decide what we wanted to put in exhibits. And then we gave the whole ideas and what we wanted to do to a professional exhibit um, designer and construction people. And they hired the two artists to make the drawings. So that's what that's how the drawings are there. That's how we got that beautiful cover. So there were a number of different people involved in this book. It was it was a team. It was a team. And how did they do the how did they do the reconstructions of the environment? Can you what were what information did you give them? A lot. A lot. Um, so for each of these reconstructions, and mostly if I can remember now the reconstructions we have in the book are those from the very recent past, the last ice age. So they 10, 12, 14 um, thousand years ago, just the other day. And from those, we know from the fossils that we have these type of animals. We have these big mastons, we have these big mammoths. We know what they ate. So if you're gonna reconstruct the environment, you have to whatever they ate, not what they didn't eat. And then we also have fossil pollen. And fossil pollen tells us exactly what was growing there at that time. And so we could reconstruct those environments. So somebody asked us once, were, those, were the mountains um, recognizable? Could he go and walk on those mountains? No. It was what the artist thought of when we gave him all the information. And then he would send something, and he'd send it back to us, and we'd talk about it and send it back to him. So it was a, a back and forth with these two artists. So while I'm talking about those fossils, I have a question for you that you've never told me. What is your most favorite fossil in the book? Oh, do you have one first? Yes, you do. Of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that, that pressure, I better have a favorite. Yeah, you better uh, have a fossil. So you better I come go up with back, I go back and forth. And one of the ones I really like is uh, a salmon that's about 900,000 years old found near Shelton. And I like it because, in part, I like it because of the story of that salmon. Um, we were, I was able to track down the people who were involved in this. and. Uh, I, two people were out, and a guy and a gal, and she, he was teaching her how to fish, and she wasn't very good at fishing, so she was sort of looking down at her feet, you know, like, you know, like, oh, God, what am I? and she looks at her feet, and she realizes she's standing on fossils of fish. He had just been fishing merrily, like, <laughs> oh, yeah, this is great fish, they're living. They look, and he, she's like, oh, not, not sure exactly, but recognize some fish, he comes, I think these are salmon. And they basically are able to then, a uh, Burke team goes out with a couple other people from not non-Burke people, collect them um, of oh, dozens of specimens. Oh, many, many, yes. many, many specimens of salmon. They're able to basically, through a variety of techniques, uh, through reconstruction, but also understanding the environment, figure out, get an idea of species. But what they figured out also is that the salmon were migrating, that these were in lake deposits, and the lake deposits um, have what are called varves, which is a year-by-year -year deposit of sediment. And I love that aspect of it because geology is based on great periods of time, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of years, and yet these lake deposits preserve a single year of time. And that's also why I like trace fossils. When you see tracks, you're seeing an individual moment in life on our planet. And I just think that's a stunning aspect. So the story eventually gets put together. These fish were migrating. And again, it's, it's a combination of people. 
It's a combination of serendipity, it's, it's science, it's paleontology to tell that story. And those are the stories that always interest me. And that I just think that's a wonderful, and it's a beautiful, beautiful specimen. There is a copy of it, a cast of it, at the Port, at Port Towns and at the uh, downtown. So if you haven't been, uh, you should go see. It's pretty stunning to see this 900,000-year-old salmon. That looks like it died probably a couple hours ago. It's, it's a really stunning fossil. There. So, you know, you've been involved with fossils for a while, and what's changed? I mean, one of the things that we, we talk about in the book is this idea of, of change in the discipline, and that was an exciting thing for me to learn about. Yeah, the discipline has changed because technology. Technology has made a huge difference to how we work. Um, when I started off, we did a lot. Well, we always do field work because even if you have all this technology back home, you want to get out there and, and collect fossils. Some of the things that have made a big difference is imaging. So we have CAT scans, we have um, MRIs, we have different types of imaging. Um, there is sonar, but you can't take it and find a dinosaur under the ground. That never actually works. You just have to have a little space. We have um, chemical techniques to look for things. We have DNA, but DNA only goes back a million years. We now have DNA from a million-year-old mammoth from Siberia, and that's very exciting. That is the oldest DNA. No matter what they say about dinosaurs, no, no. Um, we have a big interdisciplinary teams now. When I started, it was just you. You worked by yourself, and you were encouraged to work by yourself. And now you realize that you need people to help you with all the different techniques. You need people's new eyes, new ideas. And so a lot of what we do now is with a bunch of different people. And you'll see that change in the academic literature from individual authors to the academic literature to now multiple authors. Um, sometimes so the DNA one was about 20 authors. And that's really changed. So you have to, be, you have to play well together now. <laughs> so do you, do you want to tell us about, and we can do a slides? And we can... Because this is the Port Towns, Port Towns and Marine Science Center, I'm going to talk about marine fossils today. I'm going to talk about one of my favorite marine fossils is whales. We have two sections in which we're going to talk about today. In Western Washington, I'm going to talk about this time period between about 35 and 20 million years ago. And then Dave is going to jump all the way 500 million years back in time to eastern Washington. So western Washington about 35 million years ago really didn't exist as land. It was sea. It was marine, underwater. And the coastline was about where the I-5 is today. So there was no western Washington. This is the time for you who know about time scales. Um, and don't worry about the names, but I'm working from about 35 to about 20 where we have the whales. These are the rocks, and the rocks tell us a lot. The rocks are very fine-grained, and they, from a variety of different ways, we can tell they're deep water, and from the fossils, we can tell that they were very cold. So we went from a time which was very warm to suddenly a time when it was very cold and we got ice on the planet for the first time in many tens of millions of years. It was also coincidentally a time when we had a new tectonic regime here and instead of nice, shallow, warm, tropical seas, it became deep, very close to land. That's when we start to see the whales. So I want to talk a little bit about whales, because if you look at the whales, if you go down to the Marine Science Center there and you look at the whale skulls, they're really hard to understand. They're obscure whale skulls, particularly fossil whale skulls are difficult. So I want to do a quick thing to tell you about whale skulls. Um, and we always look for the skulls, by the way. We don't often have bones from behind the skulls. Um, whale skulls are different from any other mammal skulls. You know, ours are different, but whales are different. And the basic mammal skull is really like a dog skull, something like that. And the basic way of feeding, the initial way of feeding for almost all groups is carnivory. And then everything changed from that. So you have to be more highly evolved to be a vegetarian. 
So what happened with the whales, as most of you know, the nasal passages open up right back on the skull. And to do that, all the bones that are normally in the front of the skull telescoped back. And so the first arrow is where the nasal is, the second arrow is where uh, thick bones came, and of course, the whales made it more complicated for themselves by developing big brains, and those had to be covered up too. To make the nasal passages open up way back there, the bones that make up the um, jaws, the upper jaw and the lower jaw, are greatly expanded, different from any other mammal, greatly expanded bones. The other thing whales did that was weird is they stopped having mammalian teeth. You know, we have incisors, canines, and differentiated molars. We have six sets of molars. They said, no, we don't want to do that. We're just going to have one type of tooth all the way through. If you look at the tooth, you will see they don't chew. These guys can't chew. Those, they just grab their food and swallow it. The other thing that's very odd is the eye is low down in the skull, very close to the jaw joint. There's no other animal that does that. It's kind of a difficult place to put your eye. Um, and then they have the tympanic bulla for hearing. So here is a wonderful diagram of how the skull telescoped. And I love the telescope on the top. Um, and that's number B is a dog skull. And you can see the blue bones are the ones that carry the teeth. And you can see how in whales they're greatly expanded and telescope back. And the orange bones that make up the back of the skull expanded across the top of the skull to give extra strength because they had to carry this whole thing. I'm not going to go into the wonderful story of how whales evolved, but whales evolved from land mammals and went back into the sea 50 million years ago was when they first started, and this little guy was where it started. Now, this is a reconstruction. We have the bones. He was a hoofed, about the size of a, a raccoon, really small, and you can tell from, if you go back looking at whales as you go back in time, you can tell that this guy was the one who was the ancestor. So Ediocetus is one like that, and you can see the nose is right in front. The next group, um, Pachycetus, they were obviously in the water, but they still had their feet. By the time you get to Duridon, which is some of you know about Bacillosaurids, a Duridon is a real whale. It is an obligatory marine animal. But he still has the nasal fairly far forward. He has greatly expanded in the back, and he has these funny little teeth sticking out sideways. By the time you get to this modern dolphin, you can see how the skull has really changed shape. And here we have some fossils from Washington. So the exciting thing about Washington is in these um, deep water, cold water mudstones, we're finding fossil whales. We're finding both tooth whales, the odontocetes, and baleen whales, the mysticetes. And the one person who has collected, I would say, most of the fossil whales in Western Washington is Jim Geddert. I don't know if you know about Jim Geddert, but he and his wife, Gail, have been walking around. Well, he started when he was about 10 or 11. He said he had to get out of the house, so he just walked around. And he's found fossils, and he's given them to the Burke. He's given them to other museums. Um, ama an amazing man. Anyway, one of the fossils he collected was this Weimar Chinookensis um, on an island in the Columbia River. And they had about six hours in between tides. And they had to rush in there and get it. And when they got there, they found it wasn't just skull. They had the whole body. And so they grabbed the whole thing and brought it out. It was quite a story. And there it is. And you can see it has teeth at the very end of its snout. The one that's hanging up in the Marine Science Center is similar to this, but it doesn't have teeth at the end of the snout. Teeth only at the beginning of the snout. There's another one from the Olympic Peninsula. And this has very different teeth. The teeth are kind of um, denticulate and... Um, they just did a lot of different things. We have a lot of these very early whales that did a lot of different things. And mostly we have one or two skulls of each one. So it's a big puzzle. It's a huge job that still has to be done. If you looked at Mr. Seeds from the same time, and so we're now between 30 and, and 20 million years ago, we have the time period preserved in Washington fossils where the Mr. Seeds divided off from the odontocetes. 
the actual time in which they did it. And this is one of the older ones. It's from the Olympic Peninsula too. Um, and this is Carlos who studied it. And you can see, and it's, it's still, that's the old exhibit in the book. It's in the new exhibit in the book. It has no teeth, but it has no baleen either. So it was a very interesting thing. It's about, I don't know, probably about 20 feet long. Very big head, very long snout. The nasal passage, the nasal thing is about halfway through there. Um, so that is about, I would say, 23, 24, 23 million years old. And then Carlos found another one, and he named it after me, which was just so exciting. I have to admit this is from Oregon, not from Washington. Um, but it, it is a totally different animal that also has no teeth and no baleen. Much smaller, this one. Um, and you can see where the nasal is. You can see the lower jaw. It had a big tympanic bulla. Um, how did these things eat? How did you possibly eat if you don't have any teeth and you don't have baleen? Well, they studied it for a while, and this is what they came up with. In the beginning, the very early whales had all these teeth that looked much like a dog's tooth. Um, and then as they got bigger and bigger, they could open their jaw bigger and bigger. That's how the evolution went. The jaws opened bigger and bigger. And then at some stage, they lost their teeth and now lunge feed. And I know some of you know about lunge feeding. What they do is open their mouth very quickly, roll the tongue back, and suck that water in. They, they're having a, a whole suckage system. And the water goes in, and hopefully the prey goes in at the same time. Whatever it is, it can be little fish, it can be crabs, it can be krill, and then they have to get rid of the water. As they evolve, they just got bigger and bigger systems of sucking the water in until you get to a blue whale that has all these little pleated things on its chin to open up and suck it. And then, of course, you've got to get rid of the extra water, so that makes it difficult. Just because I'm an invertebrate paleontologist, I have to show you the pretty fossils. These are the animals that we know lived in cold water. These are the ones that told us where the whales actually lived and how they actually lived. Deep, cold water, many of them in areas where methane, seep, uh, methane was seeping out of the sediments, and so they were living in this very low oxygen environments. They were adapted to living in low oxygen environments. And it is those low oxygen environments that preserve the whale fossils. And so we're very grateful to those. There's a couple of other weird and odd vertebrate fossils in these um, amazing rocks. One of these is this bird called Protopterids, these three or four genera of Protopterids that look like penguins. They are not penguins. They are northern hemisphere equivalent. They, they're really related to cormorants. And we have some spectacular bones of those. Big, some of them were up to six foot tall. Some of them were smaller. Um, and I just love that, that picture. There's also this strange thing called Colpanomus that David mentioned, a little guy that looked like an otter. And we have two skulls, and that's it. Um, that's all we know. So there is a lot of work to be done out there. We need a lot more paleontologists, so please encourage people to do more. David, I'm going to give it to you now. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think one of the stories of that Liz tells, uh, I think is so amazing, is that one very short time period when so much happens. I, on the other hand, am going way back in time. Liz is recent. She's new. All her stuff she's talking about. I get to go back in time to 500 million years ago. And one of the stories about that time period is the story of Washington not existing um, at that time. So here we have, let's if I can get this, um, here's the northeastern part of the state, and you can see these belts here, the in intermontane and the insular belt. Basically, Washington state is a series of uh, pieces that have been sutured on by the conveyor belt of plate tectonics. Land has just been added to the state. Liz made the observation that 35 million years ago, Oceanfront property was basically I-5. Oceanfront property here was basically right in this corner. That's, that's it. That's all that existed of Washington State at the time. But 
It was a pretty amazing time here, in particular with trilobites. I'm guessing many of you are familiar with trilobites. I would argue that after dinosaurs, they're the most well-known um, animals that uh, really have ever existed. They were around from about 520 to about 250 million, 252 million years ago. 25,000 species of trilobites have existed, all with this classic shape of the three um, three lobes, hence trilobite, are very handsome little critters. They have these amazing eyes, very complex eyes that no one else has ever really had an eye like that. Um, and because there are so many of them, one of the things that's important is they are, in essence, little time markers in the geologic record because they would evolve and go extinct very quickly. If we find them and we can age date them, then we can say, okay, they lived from say 520 to 518 million years ago, and therefore we know that the rock is of that age. Um, in Washington, we have uh, several sort of interesting ones. We have, um, this is probably the most common one. Um, these are about five inches long, the Canadian penny for scale. These are about, uh, about less than an inch long. These are found near Spokane in a, in a curious little quarry that you, have, you cannot access anymore, if I remember correctly. These trilobites in particular, the, um, over on this side, are very well known if you're familiar with the Burgess Shale of Canada. This is the species is found in that area as well. So a pretty amazing group of animals. And again, the oldest group of animals that we have um, that uh, one of the oldest group. Then we have another interesting group in this part of called archaeocyaths. And these are a curious, curious group of animals. They're shallow marine. They're all, almost always found in limestone. They only existed for about 20 million years, from about 530 to 510 million years ago. And they were reef builders. They were really the first reef builders on the planet. So we have this very interesting record in the state of about 500, from about 500 to about 520 million years ago when these, the trilobites and the archaeocyas existed. We don't, it's not a great record. Um, the animals are not, you're sort of like, oh my God, classic fossils, but they're, they're pretty astounding to see. Again, it's the story they tell is what interests us. And then there's a huge gap in time from those animals 500 million years ago. We jump through big periods of time until we see the next bits of life on in Washington. And one of the questions is always, you know, why is life like that? And again, it gets back to the fact that Washington is a series of pieces of a puzzle assembled by plate tectonics. So we don't have everything. We don't have rocks from certain time periods. We also have a, a issue with the geology of the state, and Liz alluded to it earlier, we have all these wonderful volcanoes. Volcanoes are great for scenery and all that sort of stuff, glaciers, but they are death on fossils. They cover up fossils, that you almost never have fossils for, except the Blue Lake Rhinoceros, this incredible fossil. So every once in a while it happens, very every once in a while. We also have the, the Columbia Plateau basalts, that's not good for fossils either. So there's a lot missing. And one of the things I think that is sort of a subtle tale throughout the book is that no matter where you look on Earth, more of the picture is gone than is there. Even a place like the Grand Canyon with a mile of rock, there's still more parts of the story missing. And Washington has huge, huge gaps of time. But where, are those, where the gaps aren't, where there is life, it's a pretty astounding story. And I uh, want to end by just sort of thinking about what fossils mean, I think, to, to Liz and I. And, and I've said this before, and I just want to sum it up again, because I think it's really important. It's really central to what we were trying to do as writers and, I, and, and scientists, was convey stories about life in Washington State. Um, the, the, the file, the, the line that Liz has is stories from the geologic history of our little piece of earth. We're just a little part of the story, but we add some essential elements. And it was, uh, we were feel very lucky to been able to share the stories that the scientists are out there. The science is being done. We are sort of in a golden age of paleontology right now with so much going on, so much being discovered, so many different people learning these stories, that the, sto the, 
people who are studying has also opened up, gone from a very different period of the past of, I'm, list, I'm gonna talk about it, of old white guys looking for fossils to much greater diversity and making the story more interesting, more complete, not just about the fossils, but also our relationship to the landscape around us. And that was really a central goal for us in the book. So I wanna thank you all for coming out. We were happy to answer questions. We'll move back together um, and we will, D Diane will turn a light on and Diane's gonna do that sort of um, Oprah thing and go out in the audience and, and we will try to repeat the questions. But again, thank you for coming out. So, you know, I'm Dan, and I always have questions. I am curious what we know about the transition in the mysticetes from the, you know, no bones, no baleen, suck it in, to when the baleen whales, when the baleen itself started to develop. And do we, do we know much about that in the geologic history? We actually don't know a lot about that. There are some fossils in New Zealand that people are studying now that they can see on the palate there was definitely some development of the gums to produce the beginning of baleen. No baleen has been preserved in anything. But you can see the development of the blood vessels and the nerves in the palate to see that there was baleen. So it was about 20, 22 million years ago that some fossils began to have thickened gums that they assume was the beginning of baleen. Why don't we have baleen? Why don't we not, what? Why don't we have fossilized baleen? Oh, baleen is made from the um, same stuff as our fingernails, and it doesn't preserve. One day, we may. You know, about 20 years ago, we didn't know we had all these fossils yet. Until Jim went out and started to find all this stuff, nobody knew. Once he started, people in New Zealand started at the same time, and then, People said, well, if we've got it, and New Zealand has it, perhaps other northern Pacific. And so they found them in Japan and Taiwan. Um, people just hadn't looked for them. There's not enough paleontologists in this world. <laughs> that, that is true. <laughs> other questions? Oh, up front. Oh, where are the best places in, on the Olympic Peninsula to look for the cold water fossils that are in, particularly the whale ones? So the best place is to walk along the beaches, but you have to be aware that the beaches are private property. Um, so Twin Rivers area is famous for that, uh, but you do have to have permission or be very circumspect about it. Um, I did go there looking with a permit looking for fossils and the cops stopped me. Uh, I was with another friend with gray hair and we just pretended we were looking for birds. Ah, two, two little old ladies, with, you know, obviously birds. But I did ask him why he stopped. <laughs> I asked him why we stopped, and he said, oh, the drug runners come in through here. Um, and he wondered why we had binoculars. Well, we only had binoculars because he came along. So, so what type of drugs were you? <laughs> I'm not telling you. So here's a question from uh, sailing up to Susha Island yes. in uh, San Juan. Yes. And you can walk on the beach and there's quite a few clam fossils and little fish head fossils. Is that recent past or do we have any sense of the age on any of that? This is David's. Yeah, this is so David's good question about Susha, the fossils on Susha. Susha is, I made this sort of broad statement that Washington State is this jigsaw puzzle, and Susha itself is a smaller example of the jigsaw puzzle. So the north part of Susha Island is about 50 million year old uh, sediment uh, that was uh, terrestrial. And then the south part of it is about 80 million year old marine deposits that somehow got mushed together. So the ones on the, that south end, what you're seeing is all uh, marine deposits and probably, and in particular, ammonites are what it's famous for, those big, the cinnamon rolls that you find out there. And there are also some straight ones. And then that's also the area where our one lone dinosaur bone came from. And the dinosaurs in, in the book, and we chose not to talk about the dinosaur today because it's terrestrial and... We had to... 
We had to spread our stories around, but yeah. it's in the book. But it's, it, they are marine sediments on the south. So they're south marine, north terrestrial, 50, 80 million years. Yeah, give or t take a couple weeks. So I am going to ask about the terrestrial animal, even though I'm very interested in the whales, as people may know. Um, but the yesterday you said that they hadn't given a name to the dinosaur bone that was found, uh, but I know that it's also referred to as a Sushasaurus. Is that just a nickname? It's just a nickname. That is a nickname. Okay. It's, it's it not official. There's not nearly enough bone to call it anything, except it's a big... A big a theropod big dinosaur. Kind of cool itself. bone. Okay. But inter I'll ask you a question about this, Liz. In the past, if someone had found that, might they have given it? Oh, sure. Yes. If, about 50 years ago, somebody would certainly have given that a name, a proper scientific name. And that would have been accepted, but not anymore. And that's one of the changes uh, in the field of paleontology. It used to be they would just name things, and they would name things and name things, and they'd, they'd be wrong in the terms of they'd see one that looked like this, one looked like this, and say, oh, those are two or three different species, and it turns out one's an adult, one's a juvenile, and it was about ego. I know you're surprised. There's politics and ego in paleontology, but, and still is. It's all the main, though. It's all the main. Yeah. Dr. Nesbitt, I wanted to ask you, could you tell us the story of what was one of the most illuminating, dramatic discoveries that you were engaged with? Oh. <laughs> so one of the things that I loved, why don't I do it this way? One of the things I loved is I was working, um, a woman named Kathy Campbell did her PhD at University of Washington, and she worked along the Quinault Coast. Um, and then she left and went to California, and then she went to New Zealand, and she showed up and said, I still got all the stuff that I want to write papers about. Would you work with me? And I said, I was thrilled. I got to the Quinault Coast and collect. It was wonderful. Out there, she understood that she had some very weird-looking uh, clams and snails. She's a geologist, not a paleontologist. And she brought them back to the University of Washington and showed the, the um, biologists and they said, these are the same clams and snails that we see in deep vents, that we see in deep water methane seeps. They are the animals that I just mentioned that can live in low oxygen with methane. The living organisms, the living clams, have bacteria within their tissue, totally take over the tissue. The bacteria utilizes the methane and sulfur, provides food to the clam. And the one type of clam um, called Acrax doesn't even have a gut anymore. It just lives off its bacteria. That changed what we were looking at completely. And I remember walking down the beach and saying to myself, I've seen these things before. I've seen these things before. I went back to the museum and I started pulling open drawers. And there were the same ones from Bainbridge Island, from south of the Olympic Peninsula, from northern Oregon, the same suite of clams and snails that indicated they were living where methane was pouring out of the sediments. It was such a eureka moment. And also it was such a good feeling that this is what museums are about. They're like libraries. You put stuff in them and you might not look at them for 100 years. The first set of fossils that I looked at were in fact collected in 1909 on Bainbridge Island. So that's my story. <laughs> I, I actually think we're, that's a perfect time to end. It's, it's four, it's almost four mm -hmm. o'clock and it has been an honor and a pleasure to have all of you here to ask, sharing your, asking your questions, your enthusiasm for the subject. I want to thank Diane again yes, and, and thank you, Diane, Port so Townsend much. Marine Science Center. Yes. And and thank the Darrows for getting this going, sponsorship. It is, it's such a pleasure. Thank you.